sure all of you read it too, and to discover that it's now official, the New York Times has declared, that English chocolate is better than American mm. candy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting facts to emerge from, from this particular piece, and I do think all you to read it, it is uh, very informative, um, <laughs> was that when faced with a Hershey bar, I believe it's called, <laughs> the average American will tell you that this is how chocolate should be. It is the perfect candy bar. <laughs> if you give it to the average Englishman, he will tell you that it tastes of earwax. <laughs> now, I start with that observation, not simply to, uh, to, to, to try and uh, uh, warm you all up and, uh, and, and appear flippant and be rude to, uh, uh, <coughs> to American candy, but to make the serious point that here we have an absolutely wonderful, up-to-date, up-to-the-minute example of how it is that the cultural matrix, the, uh, the world in which we grow up, conditions our response to one particular object. The Hershey bar is earwax for one group of people, and it is wonderful, perfect chocolate to another. And what I think Shailendra, at least one of the things that is going to come out of Shailendra's very interesting uh, talk this evening, is how responses our own cultural and indeed other cultural matrices uh, <coughs> that condition the responses we have to objects that we look at. It's a particular pleasure for me to be able to introduce Shalanda Van Graaf Bhandari here this evening, a former colleague of mine at the British Museum. He is now also a former British Museum. He is at fully ensconced at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, where he is the assistant keeper of Asian coins. And without further ado, I will introduce him to talk about not just British places. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Mujo. Um, Mujo has given a um, kind of stark warning about how this long this is going to be. It's a bit of a slide here. <laughs> so, um, but I would like to start by saying that I have already written a long paper, which is about 65 pages, um, about um, this topic. Um, and uh, obviously, because of the time constraints, I really could not uh, fit in everything that I have said in the paper into the presentation. <coughs> Um, but I have managed, I think, to focus on the salient points that uh, I want to say about, uh, about things, um, which have been quite nicely um, encapsulated by Andy in his uh, nice introduction. Um, what you see here is, is, uh, is a coin um, struck um, by the Indo-Greek king Agathocles, um, which is, it sort of glorifies Alexander as one of his ancestors. And um, as we'll see soon, it, the debate about certain aspects of the Alexander's uh, imagery on points stretches beyond uh, its pretty face. So I thought I would title it not just a pretty face. So, <laughs> okay, this is where we begin. In 2005, I must also confess that I'm doing something which I'm not very used to. I'm actually going to be reading from pages. I usually speak to slides, but this is, this is uh, there are too many points here uh, that forces me to read from pages, so I hope uh, you will bear with my reading speed in a, a, a little bit. In um, 2005, uh, Osman Bukharachi and Philip Landran reported the find of a unique gold coin. And I put the word coin in quotation marks because the authors have referred to it as a medallion or a medal. Considerably because of its inherent nature as a heavy metallic object and also because they have deliberately opted to see it as such. It is indeed sensational in as much as it weighs 16.75 grams corresponding to a double dairy in denominational terms and is said to be part of a magnificent uh, treasure trove found between 1992 and 1994 in a remote Afghan village named Mirzaka. It probably constitutes the largest treasure trove found anywhere in the world, containing more than four tons of coins, jewelry, plaques, and various other objects. The coins number about 550,000. Although the book by Bukharachi and Flandran deals mainly with the discovery of the Mirzaka hoard, um, it displays the coin this particular piece as its frontest piece and its name after it. Oh, I heard a mobile phone. 
Um, the authors also regard this coin and the Mirzaka uh, treasure in general as a discovery for humanity. That's what they, they call it in the titles. The quote of Alexander the Grand, Estuar de un découvert pour la humanité. The coin shows an obverse, the head of Alexander, covered with an elephant skull. Um, and this is how the authors have described it in, in the book. Which is the symbol of his victory over India. He wears an aegis or the shield of Zeus, which shows him as uh, the protege of Zeus and uh, also as a divine being. And it also has the ram's horn of uh, Zeus Amon as a divine attribute. The reverse has uh, an elephant walking to right uh, which they think that is walking to the east, which is which is um, uh, a reference to Alexander's conquest over India, and uh, his victory over the elephant army of the Indian ruler Porus, uh, which happened in 326 BC over the banks uh, on the banks of the river Bidaspis or Jhelum, which is now one of the tributaries uh, of the Indus in Pakistan. And there is a monogram uh, which is up here. Uh, which is B and A, a composite of B and A, um, which stands for, apparently, that's how it's interpreted, stands for Basilios Alexandro, which means uh, this is the medal of King Alexander. Uh, inherent in, in this, this description um, are certain interpretative tropes, as you can see. The elephant scarf covering Alexander's head is supposed to be his symbol of uh, victory of India. And the most important thing that these people talk about is that they regard this medal as a commemorative issue of uh, um, that was issued soon after the Battle of Hydaspes in 326 BCE. Uh, the most recent um, uh, um, sort of review of this coin has been done by Carsten Darman and Wolfgang fischer bosse and they both have expressed uh, doubt about its genuineness. I will not, however, go into this aspect of the debate primarily because it is not intended to be the focus of my study. I will instead focus on the methodology employed to assign the coin to Alexander's lifetime. It is clear that the proposed contemporaneity of the coin with the Battle of the Hydaspes forms the core of such arguments. This connection has its own historiography vested in certain characteristics that the coin bears. These characteristics are the monograms, uh, as you see on the last slide. Uh, the Greek alphabet, uh, Psi, and the composite of Beta and um, oops. the composite of uh, B and A. Um, and this are the, these are the same monographs that occur on a series that has been widely called as the porous series of coins. Um, and this is where we should begin the kind of our investigative journey and come back to the Miyazaka piece at the end of it. Um, the most recent survey of the porous coinage is done by Frank Porrent, who wrote a book entitled Alexander the Great and the Mystery of the Elephant Medallions, uh, which was published in 2003. In fact, many of the interpretative views that have been expressed about the gold coin have been a kind of direct succession of what Porrent has said in his book about the porous coins. So two important things. The coin links up with, uh, with the porous coins through the monogram links. It has been seen as part of the porous coinage. And whatever has been said about the porous coinage is applied to this gold coin. Now we will investigate what has been said. Composed of B and A. 
Um, Augustus Franks donated this piece to the British Museum in 1887, and the coin ticket that accompanies the piece says that it was found at Kulum Bukhara. Bukhara is in Uzbekistan at uh, present. As Franks has collected, has collected a large number of antiquities from the famous Oxus treasure that was found in Uzbekistan at that point, and that have been turning up on the market uh, for a few years before 1887, uh, it has been speculated widely that this coin may also have been part of the same set of truth. On the reverse, this coin shows the standing figure of a Macedonian soldier holding a thunderbolt and a long lance. And even at a very early point, Um, what these motives actually mean, uh, how, how would they be interpreted, have been um, um, apparent even in very early notices of the, of the coin. The first notice appeared in uh, 1887 in the American Journal of Numismatics, where um, the coin, the piece had been identified as a decadron of the Bactrian series and offers records, uh, or set to record, some victory of Greeks over the barbarians. And the reverse shows King or Zeus, because of the thunderbolt, um, maybe a representation of Alexander. Percy Gardner, who was uh, the noted uh, scholar of classical numismatics and also the keeper of coins and medals in the British Museum, uh, wrote a note in Numismatic Chronicle in 1887. And he said, this is coin or rather metal. So here we start getting the first sort of, you know, doubts about whether it's a coin or a metal. Uh, struck on the occasion of some notable victory won by the Greek king of Bactria uh, over the invading hordes of UG uh, in the 2nd century BC. UG were uh, these kind of nomadic tribes from Central Asia uh, who, who the Greeks, Indo-Greeks uh, have um, were known to have fought. Offers, according to Percy Gardner, is Hosmanes, the Indo-Greek king called Eucratidus, and probably it's Eucratidus or his son Heliochus. So he's definitely located in the Indo-Greeks rather than Alexander. And the reverse, definitely, according to him, was a deified conqueror, Alexander the Great. But, at the end of his publication, uh, he said that the coin, or rather medal, was a historical monument. And looking, he wrote, I quote, uh, looking for the first time at the opera scene, everyone will be tempted to exclaim, it's Alexander and Chorus. So this was just a, an exclamation that uh, God comes up. It was only in 1906 that Barclay Head, then keeper of British uh, continent in the British Museum, took up that hint left by Gardner and wrote that yeah. the medallion belonged to Alexander's own time and it records the historical event of his invasion of the Punjab in 326 BC. He also stated that Professor Gardner was mistaken assigning this large coin to so a later period as the reign of Euphrates, which is like 185 BC. He further com uh, contended that the piece was struck so that it could be used as a medal for presentation to Macedonian officers rather than for use as current money. So this is again we are putting you know, the voices about uh, uh, it being a medal that the coin are being expressed. Head reiterated his views in the second edition of his Historia Orum, uh, published in 1911. And he supported them in that case by relating the scene to a description found in Anabasis of Alexander uh, by Ailey. Had formerly regarded the figure on the reverse to be a standing figure of Alexander holding a thunderbolt. He also regarded that the equestrian soldier, while pursuing the elephant, was being attacked by one of the elephant riders and not vice versa. I mean, if you see the coin, it's quite clear that the Alexander, uh, the equestrian soldier, is attacking the elephant. But Head regarded something which was opposite. He thought that it was one of the elephant riders uh, attacking the equestrian soldier. Now this is very important because this kind of role reversal that he had uh, conceptualized uh, or quoted uh, afforded him a very important fit with the textual description because it matched very closely with what Arian reports in the fifth section of Anabasis of Alexander. He mentions that Horus was riding his elephant, he was wounded in the battle, and he was pursued by Taxilis, uh, an Indian king who had actually switched sides and he was fighting alongside Alexander against uh, Horus. 
So Hex seems convinced by Gardner's suggestion that the figure on the reverse of the medallion is Alexander holding a thunderbolt. It does not provide any basis for his identification apart from his rendering of the monogram BA, which he thinks stands for Basilios Alexander. It is evident that this is entirely a conjecture, which is prompted by Gardner's suggestion. Gardner exclaims it must be Alexander and Horus. It also reverses the most plausible order of the roles played by the horseman and elephant rider. He considers the elephant rider to be the attacker rather than the one who is attacked. He thus seems to be driven by a methodological logic to fit the material at his hand into a textual reference so as to yield an easy attribution. Evidently, his inferences are open for scrutiny. However, the stance he took for identifying, interpreting, and attributed the medallion came to stay so far as the successive interpretations <coughs> of um, the medallion uh, are concerned. The British Museum acquired a second piece of the same coin in 1926. It was reported by Bobby Head's successor as a keeper of coins and medals, named Sir Francis Hill. There were additional features on this coin um, to be discerned. On the obverse, you have a, the monogram <coughs> sign, and on the reverse, just above the head of the Alexander or the, the deified conqueror, was shown a Nike, which is hovering, holding a wreath uh, in her hand as if it's crowning the victorious uh, king. Uh, the Franks, uh, the, the, the king of the reverse, wears a helmet, which is which uh, Hill identified uh, was a kind of a hybrid helmet, helmet which has a uh, which is which is has a Greek crest uh, with a Persian kerbasia, wearing tall upright plumes besides the crest. I must uh, set a record straight here at, at this point. It's Frank Horan, who wrote most recently about these points, consistently refers to this this piece as found from Iran. But uh, the the ticket that accompanies the the object. Um, which you see here is clearly says it was found from Iraq and not from Iran. So that is, that is something which is, which is very. Uh, it also came from Professor Hunstein. Uh This is something just, just for the sake of veracity. Hill contested uh, uh, Head's rendering of the monogram BA and offered that it stands for um, BAB. It's not BA, but it's BAB. And he said that this stands, the BAB stands for Babylon, and this is where uh, probably the piece was minted. Uh, minted. Hill does not challenge Head's uh, assertion that the battle scene on the offers reflected the historical events of Alexander's campaign on the Hidaspes and does not propose an alternative date for the striking of the medallions. But he thought, very important, that the horseman on the offers must be the same as the deified Alexander on the reverse because both figures were seen wearing the same sort of hybrid Persian helmet. Hill's interpretation brought together the two sides of the medallion in a much closer contextual alignment with each other than it was suggested by Head. But this convention completely disregards Head's identification of the horseman as the Indian ruler Taxilis, uh, which is mentioned by Arian. In factual terms, the identification of the horseman as Alexander would mean Horus on the elephant is being pursued by Alexander. But this is not what Arian describes. This dissociates Arian's description of the pursuit of Horus that Arian, Arian confers that role on Taxilis and not Alexander. Thus, one of the tenets proposed by Head to attribute the battle scene to the battle of the Hedaspis as described by Arian no longer stands up again. The textual fit which Head had so conveniently found to make the medallion associated with the porous episode in the first place would thus be undermined. Notwithstanding this anomaly, the identification of the battle scene as a present in the Battle of Hedaspis and that of the reverse figure as a deified Alexander became ingrained in the Hispanic literature. Subsequent writers, as we shall see, then went on to find other instances in classical literature to substantiate it further. Um, other specimens of the elephant medallion turned up since 1926. Uh, Frank Court lists 10 more uh, pieces in private and institutional hands, and 15 were supposedly present in the famous Mirzaka uh, deposit. Uh, however, it was not until 1973 that further pieces of the interpreted jigsaw appeared. But before we include these in the story, it would be appropriate to take a stock of how Indian scholars perceive the medallion 
and the supposed scene of Alexander's battle with uh, with Porus. Following this, I will offer a critique of Westernism. It is interesting, as we will see, that certain historiographic dynamics concern both the Indian as well as the Western assessments. The encounter between Alexander and Porus has been a well-known subject matter in textbook histories in India. Even schoolboys know the proud answer given to a victorious Alexander by the defeated King Porus, treat me like a king. This is a story that, that is repeated in all Indian history textbooks. This kind of story, the, the fact that it's, this, this features in the Indian textbooks, is, um, has been a largely a direct outcome of the availability of classical accounts and their methodological treatment by Western scholars being available to the Indian intelligentsia and Indian scholars. The first Indian scholars to give a thought to the elephant, elephant medallions was Jane Banerjee. And he chose the same methodological uh, met, uh, method as, um, as, as Head and Hill had been. He just chose a text, text, a classical text, and tried to fit the material into the description of classical text. But the text that he chose was Quintus Curtius, because unlike Arian, Quintus Curtius actually mentioned that Alexander pursued Porus. It was not Taxilis, but it was Alexander who was pursuing Porus. So obviously this gave a better fit to the whole, um, um, to the whole interpretation. The second um, contribution appeared in 1971 by uh, this gentleman called D.B. Pandey or Dinabandhu Pandey. And uh, regarding the battle scene on the medallions, uh, showed to be the battle between Alexander and Darius at Gogamela, not Hedaspis, in 331 BC. Frank Holt has rightly um, criticized, widely criticized uh, Holt on several counts, namely his use of sources that, like the Shah Nama. The Shah Nama is a very late source. It's not, it's not exactly that it's uh, uh, contemporary or as close to Arian to Alexander's times as, uh, as Arian is. And uh, this, 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 this particular issue of uh, that, that, uh, that the Battle of Hydaspes cannot be commemorated by this coin comes up with a very interesting dynamic. Um, so they need to be seen from the viewpoint of Indian historiography and a dynamic that is concerned with this historiography widely involves what is called as the colonial and the nationalist discourses. Um, Banerjee's example of a, of a very colonial kind of scene is exactly doing what the other Western scholars did before him, whereas Hande is seems to be have been fired by a sort of a national zeal. He thinks that an object which was which article which shows a defeat of the Indians against a Western invader brings some sort of a national shame to India, and therefore it it it, 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 it should not be that. It should be something else. It should not be anything to do with uh, the defeat of the Indians. Now both are 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 uh, quite interesting in their own historiographic uh, ways, and uh, Pandey's denial of Alexander's uh, victory. At, uh, at, 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 he doesn't stop at saying that these coins do, do not come over. He also says that uh, the Battle of Hedaspes, nobody emerged victorious. It was just a, it was just a big battle. The Porus, Porus was pursued. He was won over and to, the, to Alexander's side, but it was actually no one uh, had, had, had emerged clearly victorious. Um, however, such a discourse-based analysis of interpretations. Uh, of, it, of the elephant medallions by no means confined to contributions of Indian scholars. It is by the same historic, historiographic dynamic that we need to look at the interpretations of how Western scholars have, um, like Head and Hill, and following their report, uh, have, have, have viewed this, this particular uh, uh, question. It is quite interesting that while offering the critique of Gardner, uh, Holt makes an allusion to uh, this phenomenon called the contemporary of history. This has been famously philosophized by Colin Wood, who stated uh, all history is contemporary history. In other words, the happenings around the historian often influence his thinking and thus get reflected in his contributions. In Wood's opinion, Gardner's placement and attribution of the medallion was influenced in a major way by the circumstantial evidence of the Oxford uh, of the orchestration. And Holt suggests that had it been for, you know, if, if Gardner had been aware of Cox's concept, the fact that Gardner was aware of Cox's treasure prompted him to conclude that the elephant medallion was struck in 2nd century BC in Bactria, possibly by, by Eucratidus and, and or, or Heliognis' son. 
Similarly, Gardner's interpretation of the battle scene as a fight between the Greek king and invading hordes of Unigy was a direct outcome of the then prevalent theory of that the Tatarists had actually fought such uh, hordes of uh, Central Asian nomads. Thus, according to Holt, contemporary happenings and established historical knowledge seem to have, at least in part, influenced Gardner to interpret and attribute to Frank's medallion in the ways he did. Judging by the manner in which Buckingham makes his pronouncement about his interpretations regarding the motives on the Frank's medallion, the analytical mind is intrigued as to where the basis of his idea has come from. It is also evident that Head seems to have made up his mind what, the, what he would like the medallions to depict. It is also true that the basis of his interpretations are conjectures, for he gives no evidence for his statements. So one would wonder why Head said what he did. The answer plausibly lies in the same phenomenon that, according to Holt, uh, compelled Gardner to interpret uh, the way he did, which is contemporaneity of history. The first decade of the 20th century was a period in which imperial sentiments dominated the collective psyche of the political elite and the bourgeoisie of Edwardian Britain. He had published his interpretations in 1906, very worthy date to remember, a year which is of immense significance for the Indian national movement. Arch imperialist viceroy Lord Curzon had just announced the partition of the province of Bengal, and political opinion in India had been radicalized like never before. Till then, they had sought a moderate stand, they had sought a constitutional stand um, uh, to fight off the grievances of the imperial order. But from 1905 1906, you find that it had been radically mobilized uh, through stirring up of regional nationalisms by leaders like E.G. Tilak in Maharashtra, in India, and we see Paul in Bengal, in other part of India. And for the first time, we find that the Indian national movement found its own national, pan-national rhetoric, and that rhetoric was articulated in the form of a Swadeshi. This is an Indian word that means all Indians were exhorted uh, or, or appealed to boycott consumerism, uh, consuming anything that was British, and sort of turned back to uh, Indian manufactured goods. Head's interpretations of the elephant medallion make more sense when viewed against such a backdrop. With the characteristics of an imperialist discourse of historiography, you, know, you see that Indian scholars were colonial and, and, and um, uh, nationalist, whereas Head's interpretation fits in very well with the imperialist discourse. To him, the Battle of the Hidaspis very plausibly suggested the success of Western imperial mind which had crushed the Indian sentiment. Also, authors of classical texts viewed the Indians as a collective of tribes in fight with Alexander's Macedonian army. Drawing comparison with the British Empire at Hogwarts, with a similar mix of regional tribes or nations of India was very pertinent because it hit at the roots of, an, of the idea of pan-Indian nationalism. Predicting the doom for such tribes was inevitable. From a <coughs> viewpoint, the imagery not only fitted Arian's description, but the presence of the elephant also brought a significant visual connection with India into the picture. However, this connection also has a discourse-based dynamic of its own, as we shall see later. Hegg's suggestion that the Franks medallion was probably intended for a metal rather than used as normal current money distinctly envisages the attitude to look at the object as some sort of a memento and take it to the glorified status of a numismatic monument. This can be understood too, understood too well in the context of his interpretations. Francis Hill's interpretations of the horseman as Alexander took such imperial assertions a step further. In 1926, the Indian national movement had gathered a momentum under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, and public opinion had been mobilized against British rule to an extent much greater than in 1906. Gandhi had already launched with big success the first of his celebrated movements of non-cooperation. In symbolic opposition to the rising tide of Indian nationalism, Alexander spearing his Indian enemies fitted very well. After all, it is well known that the spear played a crucial role in building Alexander's image as the conqueror. We know from various classical accounts that Alexander proclaimed his arrival to conquer Asia with the thrust of his spear in the ground when he crossed the hell's spot. The Indianness of the riders was almost evident in the fact that they were riding the elephant. 
and their defeat was very well articulated in the observation that the animal was moving out of the field, which may be regarded as a retreat in face of the energetic charge of the equestrian Alexander. The imperial attitude is extremely well reflected also in the fact that what were originally described as barbarians in the early descriptions suddenly, silently, slowly come to be called Indians in, in these uh, interpretations. It may be stressed here that the weakest aspect of Hill's interpretation remains his identification of a horseman as Alexander because it delinks the evidence upon which Hill's predecessor, Head, has had based his interpretation in the first place. But the association of the elephant with India and the Indian nature of some of the persons portrayed on the medallions becomes a significant component of how these objects are subsequently viewed and interpreted. A major landmark in this interpretative journey was reached in 1973 when a whore was found apparently in Iraq. At the International Democratic Congress in 1973, Martin Price of the British Museum and Nancy Wagoner were given the news of an exceptional find by Nicholas, Nicholas Dürer of Geneva. A hoard, and I quote Frank Ford, of more than 1,800 silver coins, unquote, had turned up, reportedly from Babylon. Contained within this hoard were seven more medallions of the type that we have been discussing so far. But whilst the hoard was also important, as it also contained other pieces uh, that had direct links in, type, in terms of type and monograms with the medallions, with the big pieces. These new pieces weighed between 15.8 to 16.7 grams and thus conform roughly to the attic tetragram uh, uh, weight stand. Type 1, which is here, depicted an archer on the obverse and an elephant without a rider on the reverse. And you see the same monograms up here, Psi and AB uh, on these coins. At a sale by the Bank Roy, a famous uh, auction house of Switzerland in April 1975, a different type, or type 2, of the medallions uh, came to four. They showed an elephant with two riders on the back, and on the other side there was a chariot of four horses ridden by the archer and a kind of an attendant uh, standing behind him. So this doesn't have the monograms on it, but the total sort of program sort of come, you know, um, matches the, with the other points so much that there was no doubt that it's part of the same numismatic picture. In a, in a paper published in um, 1982, uh, Martin Price offered important interpretative insights into what the imagery on the larger pieces had symbolized and how the motives on the smaller coins would fit in. In the same paper, Martin Price offered his view on the chronology of these pieces and brought them into the context of a wider interpretative debate, uh, which is for, we will see further. In a subsequent paper published in 1991, Martin Price forwarded more evidence to substantiate his chronology of the Iraq war and inter alia the dating of the entire Horus coinage. At the beginning, Martin Price uh, decided to set certain uh, numismatic questions right, and he did not regard these coins, these pieces, to be medallions. He said they were, they were definitely coins; they were not medals or anything else, uh, not intended for normal currency. They were definitely coins, and they were. Um, the denominations were not decadram and tetradrams, but they were five shekels and, and two shekels. And then by calling them five shekels and two shekels, he obviously tries to sort of place them in Babylon uh, rather than the, the, the Greek uh, kind of system. And he takes uh, the coins vis-a-vis uh, -vis other coins of the four and, uh, 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 and, and, and comments that the four pieces are more worn as compared to the other pieces in, in the board, and therefore. They, they were not struck soon after the Battle of Hedaspes. This is a very interesting thing. This, this is very, it's a kind of a shift between other interpretations and these interpretations. He also identifies the archer on the, on the, on the smaller points. Uh, you go back one, one step. Uh, this archer uh, on the smaller points uh, as uh, an Indian archer. And to substantiate that, that the, the archer is Indian, he quotes again from classical sources, <coughs> which again follow the same sort of mythological uh, system. And his basis is Arian, again. Uh, that says that Arian describes in the section um, supplement to uh, Anabasis uh, Indica, he describes uh, various aspects of our Indians, and he modifies quotes from those aspects and says that these were Indians. 
Further down in the paper, uh, he observes, and I quote him, all examples of the porous coinage in the hoard are by, are, by, are by no means in a particularly fresh condition, and comparison of the very fresh lion status, that these are the other coins that were found in the hoard of 1,800 coins, um, comparison of the lion status with the porous coinage shows that the latter may be described as showing distinct signs of wear, unquote. Price interprets this difference in wear to suggest a reconsideration of the traditional idea that the five shekel uh, was piece that was struck only after Alexander's victory over Porus at the Battle of the Hidas piece and in late spring or summer 306 BC. He further states, please note the words which have been highlighted in, in red. It is perhaps premature to stress the chronological implications of the horde in the absence of the horde's full publication, but enough is now known to make it certain that it was buried uh, during or very, very soon after the issue of the series of lion staters and the royal tetragrams signed New Lambda Upsilon. This group is known both in the name of Alexander and the Philip, in the name of Philip III, making the first issue of the latter. A date of issue of 323 to 322 BC may be considered certain, and this in turn gives, gives a firm date for the burial of the era court. Further to this, uh, analysis, Price also proclaimed one matter, therefore, the horror does prove conclusively the porous coinage belongs to the lifetime of Alexander. We must reconsider um, Price's dating of the Iraq court at this point. Very evident in these two, two statements that I've said here is the fact that what was hesitatingly deemed um, premature until the full publication of the horror at the beginning of the first sentence emerges as a conclusion at the end of the second. Further, in absence of, uh, of a full publication of the horde, as Price himself admits, the purported date of 323 or 22 BC for the burial of the horde is reduced to nothing more than a tentative detail. Secondly, as the bonus coins are more worn in comparison to the fresh lion staters, Price proposes that they should have been issued before 323. But this is evidently a very qualitative assessment, the element of relativity in, the, in it, um, uh, because you know, where is, is not exactly very, very uh, uh, quantitative, it's, it's something very qualitative. Further, the coins uh, Price had a chance to look at were chiefly those that had turned up on the market and by no means reflected the true extent of the court. Indeed, Frank Court reports that 1,800 coins were originally present in the court. And even in 1991, when Price contributed a paper on coin circulation in Babylon, he had barely managed to put together about 300 pieces from the whole. So this is not exactly very full publication. This may not be considered as a full publication. Uh, what is also important that in this article in 1991, he had included pieces that had turned up on the market as late as 1989 which he believed had been part of 1973. Also noteworthy is the fact that one coin, which is number 86 in Price's list, that offers a very crucial link of a monogram sequence that helped Price to reinforce the 323 <coughs> date, is from a 1989 person. And we have no evidence apart from Price's guess that it was part of the 1973 The relative difference in the, in the wear of the coins is to be explained by the importance that coin collectors usually give to the condition of pieces which directly determine their collectability. It is therefore conceivable that amongst the many lion staters from the horde, only the freshest would continue to reach the market. Indeed, the data provided by Michel Thur, which is the son of Nicholas Thur to Frank Court, indicates that approximately 700 lion staters were present in Iraq and in, in the horde, out of which price could only account for a little more than 100. It is very likely that these 100 pieces were perhaps the best preserved of the horde and thus appeared on the busy side of the market such as prominent auction houses, from where numismatists like Price would make a note of them. In view of these factors, Price's chronological assessment needs to be deemed very tentative. However, the date that he provided became a chronological benchmark for many successive interpretations of Horus coinage. Crucial to Price's interpretation was his understanding that the elephant riders as well as the archer represent Indians. Uh, we should now proceed to analyze uh, this, this contention 
that the non-Greek persons, as you see on, on the coins, are Indians. Of course, Pride was not the first to interpret them as such, but he certainly was one of the first to substantiate this identification of the description of Indians from classical accounts. The main source that he used was Arians Indica. Price's interpretation at the first point, I must say, that is quite unilateral and depends on entirely on classical accounts for identifying the origin. Price does not concern any Indian source as a possible basis for comparison, either in the context of the motive uh, or as a secondary corroboration of Arian statements. When Arian's account is consulted afresh, some important aspects become evident. There exist several discrepancies between what he writes and the use Price makes of him, of, of his description. In Indica 16.6, Arian describes the large size of the Indian bow and states that the Indian archer set their foot on it before shooting. Taking a look at the archer on the coins, one would readily see that this is not what he's doing. There's a distinct gap between his foot and the base of the, uh, uh, of the bow. But Price has rendered this description as the archer set their left foot against him, so on it becomes against him. Whether Price intentionally did this to accommodate the archer's image on the coin with Arian's description, or whether he was using an edition in which it was really mentioned as that, we will we'll never know. When Arian describes the costume of the Indians, he says that they wear a linen tunic down to the middle of the calf, and one garment thrown around their shoulders, and the other one, the third one, wound around their heads. This linen tunic reaching the middle of the calf uh, seems like a description of the ubiquitous uh, Indian garment, the dhoti. Our archer on the coins wears a lower garment that barely reaches his knees. And he also wears a sash-like upper garment. It is not thrown around his, his, his shoulders. And um, there is no, definitely no uh, garment bound around his head. Price also mentions uh, that, it's quoted by Strigo, that Indians twist their hair and tie them with a band in, in the form of buns. The Indian identifies uh, the headgear, the head part of this, this particular archer as kind of representing the Indian bun like of here. But as you can see, it's, it's hardly tied up in, in, in buns. Then in the same section in, of Indica, Indian mentions some other characteristics of Indian archers. In the left hand, they carry small shields of raw hide, narrower than their bodies but not much shorter. Even though the archer on the coin is portrayed with both his hands engaged in shooting the arrow, one would assume that such a prominent piece of his weapon uh, should be given visual, proper visual articulation. But no shield is seen anywhere in the picture. And it further states that all archers carry a broad sword, uh, not less than three cubits long. No sword is seen anywhere in, in this picture um, in the art. It is clear that Price is being very selective when adducing information from Arian's account, picking only the details that he thinks fit the, the archer on the coins. It is thus yet another example of selectively adducing evidence to, to, to suit interpretations. From what we have seen so far, there can be no doubt that Price's identification of the bowman on the, on the smaller coins as an Indian infantryman based on Arian's description is severely flawed. It suffers from two salient methodological drawbacks. First, the distortion of Arian's account as seen with the posture and the way Indian archers reportedly shot their arrows. And secondly, selectively taking Arian statements in order to match what seems like a preconceived notion to regard the woman as Indian. Also, the fact that Price does not consider any Indian source for his identification remains the overarching drawback of his interpretation. <clears throat> to set the record straight, we shall turn our attention to Indian evidence comparable to Arian's account. It could come from two sources, the text and material uh, depiction. This is a depiction that sort of comes very close to what Arian describes uh, in terms. Uh, it's from a cave temple in central India at Baja, and it's an archer, as, 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 as Arian has described. Now, when you look at this particular image, it, it is quite clear that Arian makes a lot of sense when he describes the Indian archer. There is a linen tunic reaching the middle of the calf, exactly the middle of the calf. There is a very long bow, as you can see. Uh, there's a strap which he wears. There's no shield seen, but there are two straps running across his chest, and one strap might be for the shield, you can say that. The hair is tied in buns, and uh, a, a garment is, uh, is, is, is uh, bound around it. And this archer, and although it matches the description of Indian, 
does not look anywhere like the arch on the coins. Now you can, you can sort of allow stylistic uh, differences, but this is by far a very clear indication of um, what Arian is talking about is not nonsense. It's, 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 particular, it's quite, quite true and it is quite well represented in, um, in, in this, this particular uh, depiction of the arch. The textual evidence uh, from, uh, from, for Indian, um, from Indian sources comes from this very famous text called Arthashastra, which is attributed to a, a man called Kautilya, who was a prime minister of an Indian king called Chandragupta Maurya. This, this Chandragupta Maurya is contemporary to Alexander and uh, is referred to a lot of, uh, uh, in a lot, lot of classical accounts as Sandrakotus. And when this is considered, this is consulted for um, um, the description uh, that they describe the uh, describes the archers comes in the 18th chapter in the 36th, 36th uh, section. And Kautilya describes there are three bows uh, which are called Karmuka, Kodanda, and Druna, made from three different kinds of wood and horn. And five kinds of arrows are listed, which are Venu, Shara, Shalaka, Dandasana, and Naracha. The last Naracha arrow is an all metallic arrow, it's not uh, the rest of the arrows have a wooden body and a metallic tip, but Naracha arrow is, is constructed entirely of metal. The length of the arrows is not given, but it is mentioned that the tips for cutting, piercing, and striking are made of iron, bone, or wood. As for swords, three further types are listed, namely Nistrimsha, Mandalagra, and Asiyashti. Now, each of them have a different kind of uh, construction um, uh, detail. Nistrimsha is a, is a long, curved tip, etc. Thus, judging from the methodological viewpoint and comparative analysis, Price's identification of the bowman as Indian infantryman comes under serious doubts. His identification of the elephant motif, seen on the other side of the coin as stemming from an Indian source, is easier to contest, for Price himself describes several instances of elephants being used by Alexander and his enemies, years before he ever came across uh, the elephant army of the Indian king, king Horus. It is well known that elephants were present in the Persian army of Darius at Gogomela in 331 BC. The use of elephants to indicate power and glory has not been confined to any particular realm like India. It has been a phenomenon well attested in the entire ancient world in both myth and history. Like the archer, therefore, it is difficult to believe in Christ's interpretation of the elephant as anything particular, particularly to do with India. Equating the animal in such a simplistic fashion with India is an example of the Orientalist discourse, viewing, which views India through her exotic. As for the other two motives, uh, seen on the smaller denomination of the so-called Horus coinage, the elephant riders and the chariots, there are more comparisons to be had from Indian artistic traditions. Uh, just to show uh, kind of examples of uh, elephant riders from Indian tradition, these are the two silver plates uh, found in the uh, 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 in the British Museum, in the British Museum collection, which shows these elephant riders. And what is very important to note that the person who stands in the front is covered with, with a parasol. And therefore, he is the most important person in the assemblage. He is the king. And indeed, uh, the person who stands in the front is the king who commands the elephant. And commanding an elephant is a kind of a royal honor in, in the Indian tradition. So when, when you compare this with uh, the depiction on the coin, if it was, if it ever depicts uh, the battle between Porus and Alexander, then you know who amongst the elephant riders is Porus, because there are two elephant riders. The one who stands in front and retaliates back at the equestrian soldier is definitely supposed to be Porus, uh, as seen from these two pieces. All the, all, all the depictions seen on the smaller coins come together on this one piece of uh, antiquity, which is again quite similar in, in terms of context uh, to the pieces uh, uh, which were supposed to be found in, in, in Punjab and Gandhara, because this comes from the place, a place called Gondla, which is kind of um, uh, eastern Gandhara region. And next one. Uh, that vase has etchings on both sides, and they show these particular kind of um, the elephant riders and a chariot. Now again, we see from comparing this, these kind of depictions, which are from proper Indian tradition, 
Uh, if you compare these with uh, the definition of single coin, we see that there is absolutely nothing like it. And price at one point also suggests that the, the, the chariot motif on the, on, the, on the smaller coins actually reminds you of an Assyrian motif. Now, how does something which is ostensibly Assyrian suddenly start with, uh, being called Indian is a, is, is a good question. But this again matches very closely with what Arian describes. They have hairs in buns, garments across their shoulders, and if you see um, from um, um, here, there are linen tunics coming exactly halfway down the calf. So this is this is this is th these are uh, two depictions of Indians as Arian has described it, and you can see um, it's quite evident that how they they differ from what uh, what, what appears on, on, on the on the silver coins. There are some um, other uh, representations, uh, interpretations of this debate, which we just kind of, you know, we can quickly run through. Um, I, I will not go into great details here because these are this is kind of slide is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, what is important in this slide is is the contribution of Paul Bernard, who is a French uh, scholar, and uh, he attributed for the first time these coins to a satra in in the Punjab named Judamos. But what is, I mean, even though the, this attribution is rather uh, um, tentative, what is important about Paul Bernard's contribution to the whole debate is that he was the first scholar to actually make use of Indian um, uh, sources. It was quite important that he was the first person who uh, included the depiction of the archer that I've shown you and uh, also the plates that I've shown you from the British Museum collection into, he sort of integrated them into his discussion. And this satra, uh, kind of satra connection that Paul Bernard comes up with had been, has been taken up by three other scholars, Carmen Armar Biucci, uh, Andrew Stewart, and Robin Lynn Fox. Um, and they actually attribute these points to other satraps called Mazaios, Xenophilos, and Tabulitis. And their attribution uh, sort of comes after Price, because Price at one point also sort of tentatively plays with the idea that these points were actually issued by satraps and not by uh, Alexander. Coming to the last, or uh, uh, the most recent interpretation of, um, of the uh, elephant medallions, uh, we should take a stock of the latest assessment of uh, uh, the Boris College by Frank Holt. Um, much of what has been said about the gold piece rests on what uh, Frank Holt has said. Holt has made a critique of individual instances involving previous interpretations. All of his arguments cannot be discussed here for want of time. I will, however, concentrate on Holt's comments on Michener, Bernard, Lane Fox, and last but not least, on Price. Conceivably, Holt's views on the interpretations of these authors in turn draw, comment, agree, or refute some of the salient previous assessments like, like those of Head and Hill. As is evident from the title of his book, Holt preferred to term the so called chorus commemoratives as medallions. Indeed, Holt discusses this terminology at some length in his book. He suggests a difference between a coin and a metal primarily to be, and I quote him, a coin is a medium of exchange while the metal has no monetary function. Sometimes a large monetary object may also be uh, may also serve a commemorative purpose, but these are sometimes called medallions, and quote. But in the book, the, his usage of terms like metals, medallions, medallic coins, and monetary metals, he sort of uses quite indiscriminately. At one point, he even suggests that the objects under discussion could have been both coins as well as metals. It must be noted that medals, in their true sense, do not ordinarily enter general circulation, as monetary tokens or commemorative coins do. So while medallic coins may just mean large coins, Holt's uh, usage of the word of the term monetary medals uh, seems quite difficult to comprehend in a numismatic sense. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a medallion simply as a large medal, usually one larger than 100 mm in diameter. Um, and the crucial point to be noted here is that this definition does not include any of the connotation of that, that Frank Holt uh, supposes that is a kind of monetary connotation that he incorporates into his description while suggesting that a medallion is a large monetary object with a commemorative purpose. Holt's interpretation of Holt's coins as monetary medals therefore needs to be probed further. Clear even from the early pages of Holt's book is a bias. Holt seems to have taken the liking to the idea that Holt's decadran being a medal or a medallion as it was described in the first instance of its publication by Gardner. The view that it was struck in such a capacity to commemorate a Macedonian victory over the barbarians 
reflects an antiquarian romanticism associated with the depiction of the battle on, seen on the piece. It is the same romanticism that set the general tone of Ford's monograph, uh, which its anecdotes about the office's treasure, it mentions of Charles Darwin and experiments with earth forms, and the tempo of the last chapter, A Dark and Stormy Night, Ford's book no doubt makes a very interesting reading. Nothing else in Ford's treatment of Michener illustrates this romanticism. Commenting on Michener's, Michael Michener's interpretation of the battle scene as that depicting the Battle of Gogamela, Holt admonishes him by saying, and I quote, Michener follows a dangerous method. Regardless of what is shown on the artifacts, he allows himself to decide which battle should be commemorated. We cannot base such judgments on what we now think is important, ignoring altogether what Alexander and his contemporaries might have believed. Unquote. But it is evident in this statement that Paul himself is following the same dangerous method of deciding himself what Alexander as his contemporaries might have believed. After all, as something that is now firmly consigned to history, uh, what exactly Alexander and his contemporaries believed is at most uh, open for a reconstruction as an interpretation of the battle scene is. Paul comments further that as decided from a modern perspective, how important was a battle was cannot matter in deciding what the scene depicts. According to him, what really matters is the mindset of Alexander and his troops. In such a reasoning, Frank Ford comes forth as someone who has given the powers of reading the mindsets of historical personalities. In order to ascertain what a group, a, a, a group of medallions would depict. This is very indeed a very deterministic kind of interpretation. His assessment of Michener has undercurrents of a professional divide between numismatists and historians. Paul's main criticism at Pande and Michener is about their interpretations which dissociate the piece from Paul's context. To make his point clear, he comments, numismatists and historians have overwhelmingly maintained a view that these metallic objects commemorated Alexander's successful campaign against Paulus. It may be pointed out here that such a view has been supported amongst numismatists only by Aidan Hill. Martin Price, a numismatist par excellence, did not view the coins as commemorating the campaign against Poros. Other numismatists like Nicole Pia and Arnold Yuchi saw their origins um, not in India but in distant Babylonia or Susiana. So the Poros connection has not been so overwhelmingly stated by numismatists as Paul tries to put it through. One of the surmises which Paul accepts uh, that the men seen on type the other coins uh, represent Indians. So this is a, a, a major survival on which uh, most of his interpretation rests. In Terraria, he also construes that the elephant riders or the decadrans should be Indians. The entire dynamic of Ford's interpretation thus moves around the methodological othering of the Indians in context of the Macedonian Greek. So he, he misages his, his logic into two words one is the Greek word and the other is the Indian. Ford has not been the first scholar to see it this way. A similar attitude had worked for Hayden Hill with an imperialist clan and for Pandey, the Indian scholar, with a nationalist clan. You know, they also viewed it in the same sort of uh, two-world two kind of separations. The origin of this dynamic involving the conflict of the two worlds, for the Greek, Macedonian and Indian on one side and Indian on the other side, is entirely rooted in the historiography of the debate. This is in itself does not extend beyond the colonial period in India and obviously has contemporary undertones at every point it evolves in a historiographic sense. Ford's view of emphasizing the Indian other is evident in his dismissal of the interpretations of the monograms representing as satraps, Abdullahis and Xenophilos, uh, which was articulated by uh, Andrew Stewart and Robin Lynn Fox. It is on the last point that uh, Ford makes against the Abdullahis and Xenophilos interpretation, which is the most salient in terms of the methodological othering that we have been talking about. He contends that these coins may not have been issued by satraps because the satraps may never have portrayed the Indian soldiers on their coins because they could never have the intimate knowledge of Indian warfare, which is so confidently displayed in artwork of, these, of, 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 the, of the dyes of these coins. Here is a military satrap and a governor, and who think, uh, who represent uh, the Hellenic world, and they are so much other <coughs> to the Indian world that according to Paul, they had no intimate knowledge of Indian warfare. This statement very evidently excludes the historical possibility of how interspersed, connected, and fluid ancient cultures may have been. After all, we know that knowledge in various forms has 
always transcended such cultural, ethnic, or geographic barriers when it comes to its dissemination. The elephant as representing anything Indian takes back um, uh, to the same orientalist logic of imagining India through our exotica. For it is amply well understood that the use of animals was, in warfare was well known before that. Hoare's other claims are that these medallions were struck as commemoratives and were unusual products of a makeshift of or traveling mint. They were thus not struck at Susa or Babylon, as Price and others have done. He also offers a suggestion uh, that uh, these were not intended to be circulating coins of the usual imperial varieties, but rather as commemorative medallions or aristia, valuable rewards for distinguished military service. All these points require to discuss quickly. Well, it takes a few pages to demonstrate how badly the coins have been manufactured. The selling points to arrive at such a conclusion will not only make the intrinsic aspect of the coins, such as their weight, also all the other features like the condition of the planches of the blanks and the way they had been fashioned, the borders and the die axis and the presence or absence of monograms, etc. Judging from such technical angles, it also gives some thought to what practical purpose that these medallions might have served. At the end of his assessment, he comments, and I quote, we can determine that overall, the manufacturers of these large and small medallions took no pains whatsoever to produce a uniform vintage in regard to weight, shape, centering, or die axis. All this, even though the dies with which they were struck had been marvelous and finely detailed. According to Hall, these are the telltale signs of a hurried and poorly supervised minting. On the purported nature of these objects, Hall remarks that as medals, they were produced in small numbers, but as poorly supervised currency, they show weight variation. And therefore, he explains this by accepting that these coins function as these medallions function both as medals and coins. This is a very strange kind of logic. I, I fail to understand. That. Much of the numismatic aspects of Holt's argument shows that he does not recognize the basic fact about these objects that they are first and foremost coins. Their method of manufacture, their occurrence with other coins in the hoard, and the pattern of monogram links they exhibit across the denominational range makes this amply clear. All the known decadrams show signs of wear in circulation. It is therefore a plausible certainty that this is how they were primarily received after they were manufactured as monetary objects intended for circulation. The uneven striking with, with, with most large coins show is evidently the result of the fact that they were struck on large metallic flans. Larger flans require greater striking force in order to the impression on the die to get transferred onto them, and this may not be generated with a single blow of the hammer. Repeated blows might be required, and this is exactly what Holt refers to as haphazard hammering. The fact that the medallions are poorly struck is thus the result of their inherent characteristics and the technique employed in their manufacture. It is not because they were made in a hurried manner or at a makeshift mint as for uh, contents. Also, one would expect if all these objects were specially struck as mementos, the very anomalies that holds in this to attribute them uh, to ill supervised minting should not be there in the first place. If making a medal, if you take care to make a medal nice and neat, you will not have all these kind of uh, incongruences like you know, hurried striking. One would also imagine mementos such as metals would not leave their receivers to enter general circulation to the extent the worn appearance of most decadrams suggests. In the wake of such arguments, the range of Holt's assertions, like the objects being both coins and metals, being products of a makeshift mint, being intended for a limited audience and not intended for general circulation, do not seem convincing. From the hurriedness in their striking and the utilization of their dyes in a less than ideal minting operation, Hold comes to the conclusion that not only as to why they were struck, but also where and when they would be struck. Hold proposes to view the purpose of the issue of the medallions as commemoration of the Battle of the Hedaspes. For the weight of evidence and this passionate analysis has fallen squarely on its side. This is, this is you know, he's exhorting us to believe what it makes sense. The Battle of the Hedaspes in 326 BC thus provides a turbulence post when and the estimated burial date of the Iraq war, as proposed by Martin Price in 323 BC, provides the terminus antiquity. As Aristia presented to the veterans of the Indian campaign, they must therefore have been struck sometime between these two dates, that is, the summer of 326 BC and perhaps the departure from India in late 325 BC. It's amazing that you can actually point out striking these points within one year in history. 
The Macedonian army, as Ford says, was either struggling, what was the Macedonian army doing at this point? It was either struggling through the Gedrosian desert at this time, or safely back in territories near enough to have used establishments. If the army made use of establishments, how could Ford conclude that the mint where the medallions were struck was either traveling or makeshift? Further, if it was struggling through the desert as it was, <coughs> how did it have access to the metallic resources from which coins, especially the large ones, 40 gram coins, could be manufactured? It must be said at this point that Ford's statements are kind of internally quite incongruous. Moreover, the analysis so far as the interpretations of the battle scene is concerned, that he claims to be dispassionate is only after Head's original claiming that the scene is reminiscent of the Battle of the Hedaspes. That claim was far from being dispassionate, as we have seen, because it had airs of imperial assertions about it. Indeed, as we have seen earlier, it comes almost like a bolt from the blue, riding high on what was a mere suggestion of God. Similarly, the dating of the Iraq war has been done in a subjective manner by Price. Thus, the context of the striking of these medallions, large and small, and the chronological termini that Ford proposes to place them within are both not free from doubt. As for the weight of evidence like textual corroborations, we have seen how shaky this has been, going primarily to the methodologies employed by the scholars. It's not, the, the texts are alright, but the way the scholars have used them are, are, are quite shaky. Um, so this, this slide sort of gives a quick summary of what have been, I have been saying so far. Um, the first three, three or four points are, are pretty clear, I, I need not sort of elaborate further and waste time on this. But the last two points are, are from an interpretative point, quite important to me. Because I think it was Head, Hill, and Price, these three people, have set the general interpretative tone for uh, describing and interpreting these objects. So I regard them as a kind of a vertical order of interpreters. Whereas Bernard, Holt, and others, including Operacci and, and uh, people who have viewed the gold double direct, have taken elements from these three uh, estimations and have constructed lateral narratives around it. So these I would regard as a kind of horizontal order of, of the interpretations. And certain aspects of the debate are definitely very much still open, especially the date of the burial of Hirafor as proposed by Martin Price and the whole um, the uh, identification of Indians in the whole thing is definitely worth a uh, 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 reconsideration. Next one. <coughs> so that, that brings us back uh, to the double dead. This piece is no doubt a remarkable piece in more than one way. As a double dead, it represents a heavy gold denomination and shows a head of Alexander covered with an elephant skull head here. This is evidently a posthumous feature. For it first appeared on the coins of Ptolemy, who ruled Egypt and was a key person in the institution of the Alexander cult. But the reverse of the double diary resembles the elephant motif I seen on type 1 of the tetradrams in the Chorus series. The Greek letter and the monogram seen on the tetradrams and tetradrams in the Chorus series, namely Xi and AB, are also seen on these coins. This obviously ties up the double diary with the main Chorus series of coins. Uh, The coin is therefore consigned to a wider debate that concerning Alexander's deification during his lifetime. For this coin certainly bears divine attributes such as ram's horn stuck under the elephant's skull. Other contentions about it take some aspects of the analysis back to partly heads cross pronouncements such as the monogram AB or BA standing for Basilios Alexandra, much as what partly head access. It will be said here that the descent of this assessment is another in the horizontal order of the imagery. It does not claim any new ground, uh, ground as far as the interpretations of the motif is concerned. And it is borrowed largely from Ford to a certain extent from Head in claiming to have found the first lifetime portrait of Alexander, the evidence from the Hieropolis Bandiki, Memphis and Locratus coins has not been taken into account, nor has any detailed thought given to explain the presence of divine attributes so early on. Now Hold, when he discusses the thunderbolt in his in the hand of a standing lady on the coins, he makes this really fantastic claim that it's a metaphor and it alludes to a particular um, power that Alexander commanded, thunder. And we all know, as, as seen, as is shown in Alexander, the movie Alexander, that the Battle of the Hedaspes was formed on a, uh, was fought on a very stormy night. It was raining, it was, it was June, it was monsoons, and it was, it was raining quite heavily. 
So the use of that thunderbolt in Alexander's hand is not just to allude to uh, the fact that he is deified, it also alludes to a very specific aspect of Zeus, that is to control the thunder and lightning. Now that is a metaphor, and uh, it's not, Frankfurt says that it's a <coughs> metaphor, it is not a clear divine attribute. Now one would wonder if on the silver coins, if they shown as a, as a metaphor only, why on the gold coin in the same series it's very explicit. All these divine attributes are very explicit, the ram songs are very explicit. That is not a metaphoric uh, kind of uh, inclusion in the portrait. The search for the answer to this inconsistency revealed several inconsistencies in the wider demonstrative picture with respect to this coin. Uh, but before we turn to see how problematic the recent interpretation of the almost can be, let us see from critical viewpoint how the assertions of the reverse motives fare with respect to the discussion so far. Firstly, the assertion uh, that the monogram BA stands for Basilios Alexandru has no basis, but was the first unfounded suggestion that Barclay had had offered. This is what uh, two leading experts say about the BA monogram. Martin Price says that any numismatist um, would hesitate in modern times to read the monograms of Basilios Alexandru or Babylonia. And Holt also contends that nearly everyone now discusses King Alexander and Basilio, the Babylon readings for the BAB uh, monograms. Given such a consensus, the interpretation of the monogram as referring to Alexander is reduced to the resurrections of norms long discarded to suit a modern league fashion. Also, what Mokarachi does is he includes the explanation of AB but leaves the Psi completely out of the picture. So if AB means Mathematical Alexander, what does the Psi mean? It is not answered. The rendering of the elephant skull as indicating the conquest of India actually comes from another instance. Interpreting in a similar way, was W. W. Tan, who saw a similar portrait of Demetrius I, the later Indo-Bactrian ruler, ruler, as a reference to the Roman historian Justin's description of Demetrius as conqueror of India. In terms of contemporaneity, the obvious comparisons for the depiction on the double direct is the portrait of the Ptolemaic coins of Egypt. But as Bird Smith has observed, Alexander depicting an elephant skull on these coins has an open-ended context. It could have referred to Dionysos or to Alexander's own context. It is not very clear what exactly was, was being referred. This is a kind of word thing. To regard it exclusively as an indication of the conquest of India is therefore definitely open for doubt. The view that the elephant on the reverse refers to the conquest of India is another testimony to the survival of an orientalist rendering of these motives. We have seen that there is nothing to justify such an inference. Further, the contention that the march of the elephant is to the east is amusing, to say the least, because Firstly, it epitomizes the Hellenocentric view um, as emerging outwards from Greece, and secondly, if the coin were turned around, the effort would be change its direction and would march to the west instead of the east. Um, this is by far the most simplistic interpretation anyone has ever attempted in order to link these coins with India. Further, as we have seen, there is nothing to base inferences such as any of these coins were struck. A. Soon after the Battle of Hydaspes, B. As commemorative of the India campaign, and C. At a mobile or it driven mint. The interpretative statements with regard to these aspects therefore fall in consequence. More than that, this interpretation arises only when we see the object in connection with the porous encounter and not otherwise. And we have seen that the basic tenets upon which such connection has been arrived at is not free from doubt and inquiry, most significantly out of all the uh, interpretations I would highlight, hence pronouncement of uh, the porous connection. It was just a kind of a, uh, 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 taking up a suggestion of Percy Gardner's predecessor and just sort of airing it without any evidence. The identification of archers and elephant drivers as Indians have no basis, and Martin Price's dating of the Iraq court is also definitely open for further inquiry. These are the three such significant tenets, and we have seen that all these are very undeniable. Each of them has also been a product of a certain historiographic dynamic. They are indeed, therefore, a discourse-affected constructs. They are not uh, judging what the historical truth is. These instances demonstrate how much the modern historical debate about how Alexander was portrayed has indeed gone beyond his pretty face. It has reflections of personal viewpoints and contemporary politics, and that has clouded over a rational assessment. It can be investigated in a discourse-based fashion against the backdrop of a variety of isms, which 
which is colonialism, imperialism, post-colonialism, nationalism, <coughs> orientalism, classicism, and even romanticism. A certain <coughs> historical truth uh, has never been more fascinating. Some facts, however, can be said to hold good, notwithstanding the over-historicizing of the evidence at our hands. That the constituents of the poorest coinage are primarily coins and need to be seen as such, that they are decidedly Mesopotamian, so far as their fabric and provenance are concerned, and that the figure of the Macedonian soldier quoting Thunderbolt on the Decagrams, in, in all possibility, is that of Alexander the Great. But anything said beyond these aspects, particularly in an interpretative tone, may go beyond the object assessment one could do with the evidence at our disposal. So my point is, there's a lot of history has been seen in, in, in these objects. The objects don't actually contain all that history. It's people trying to, because they are affected by various discourses, they try to see the history as reflected from these, these points. Having said that, many scholars and colleagues to whom I showed the draft of this paper commented that what all this proposed deconstruction was in aid of and whether I have anything to say constructive. My stance has been that too much history has been seen in these objects. But strictly as a postscript, if I were to make a calculated guess, it is my opinion that Robin Len Fox's attribution comes closest. Judging by the evidence at our disposal, it is very likely that Xenophilos, the Sutra by Susa, could have been responsible for striking the porous coinage, and the Tsai, the monographic Tsai, may well have been his mark. I will, however, hesitate to interpret the BA, AB monograph as that of Pabulitis. However, also from a chronological viewpoint, I see no compelling evidence to place the issue of these coins during Alexander's lifetime mainly because the basis upon which Martin Price's analysis is based is not particularly sound, as I have shown. The post-Alexander placement of the coins will automatically dissociate the interpretation of the AB or BA monogram in Pabellitis, as we know, that he was executed by Alexander's orders sometimes before uh, Alexander's death. However, the attribution to Xenophilos will still hold good because we know that he was around at Susa until at least 380 or 370 BC. The deification of Alexander evident in the depiction then can be more easily justified and it, it, it need not be treated as lifetime. What the BA or AB monogram conveys could be anyone's guess. It could well mean anything. It could mean, including the two possibilities uh, that have been watched in the past, maybe Basilios Alexander or Babylon or whatever it is. Um, if the coins are indeed the issues of the Satra and if they post date Alexander's lifetime, the victorious and deified image on the rivers of the Decadrams is well justified. The archer soldier on the obverse of the type 1 Decadrams and the quadriga at the scene of the type 2 Decadrams would also be explicable, not from an Indian, but from Persian people. In this respect, it is worth noting that as far as the headgear of the archer is considered, it looks remarkably similar to that of the figure of a charioteer among the Persian army depicted in the famous uh, mosaic of the Battle of Issos <coughs> and you see, this is this is the charioteer behind, uh, shown behind Darius in the in the mosaic at Pompeii. And if you see the profile that he has, sort of, this is the bad slide. I'm sorry about that, but it sort of kind of roughly matches with uh, with the with the archer on the on the on the silver coins. This is the figure standing immediately behind the chariot riding person, King Darius and wields a whip in his hand. Among the many Persians in the mosaic, the profile perspective of this man provides the closest match for the archer on type 1 tetradrax. He thus becomes the only worthwhile contender to draw a comparison from. And the similarity that I have said is self-explanatory and very evident. I mean, I did not sort of uh, go further into details on this. The crucial question would be what does the battle scene on the offers of the tetradrax and other motifs composed of the elephants on the tetradrax represent? As I have outlined above, or before, in the talk, they pose a problem of interpretation and a historic fit only when seen as representing the Indian other. But it is not historically compelling to regard them as exclusively Indian. <coughs> Similarly, the case cannot be effectively made for the battle scene to represent a historical actuality or fact. If at all, and here again I am making just another speculation, if, if it were to be regarded as such, removing alien spectacles, Gogamela would qualify as a as it has been. Needless to say, such conclusions have important bearings on interpretations of the double dare, the gold coin. Even in case it were to be set free from various other doubts, whether it is genuine, fake, or whatever, it is difficult to agree that it is a lifetime issue, based entirely on its connection with the porous coinage. 
indeed, the calculated case that I have referred to um, of Xenophilos um, is to believe posthumous date seems even more likely. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank these various individuals who have been very uh, instrumental in helping me with this uh, with this paper. Uh, no, most noteworthy is Professor Keith Rutter from Edinburgh who suggested read the draft several times and suggested uh, a lot of uh, uh, changes and revisions and make very, very worthwhile comments. Um, the full uh, length, the uh, paper at full length for whoever is interested is published in an Indian publication entitled Memory as History, that's the main title. The subtitle is uh, The Legacy of Alexander in Asia, which is edited by uh, Professor Iman Shure um, uh, in New Delhi and Dan Potts of the University of Sydney in, in Australia. And it is published from New Delhi by publishers called Aryan, not Aryan, but Aryan Publications. Um, I've been going on for a bit too long, but uh, considering the original paper was 67 pages, this is uh, a shorter version. Thanks a lot for waiting. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.